he is, but you will. Now, last night he pulled off one of the biggest political upsets of the year by defeating incumbent Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski. But how did this newcomer pull this off? Well, it wasn't easy. On June the 2nd, the unknown conservative entered the race, and a month into his campaign, 54% of those polled, well, they didn't even know who he was. But in the week leading up to the August 24th election, things started to change when the Tea Party ramped up its support for Miller. And around that time, the former governor of the great state of Alaska, Sarah Palin, and her husband, Todd, well, they stepped in and endorsed Miller as well, and it must have worked because on Election Day, the voters went to the polls, and when the dust was clear, well, Joe Miller was leading by less than 2,000 votes. Now, because of the margin of victory and because it was so close, they turned to counting absentee ballots, and after eight days of counting, the result was obvious. Based on where we are right now, I don't see a scenario where the primary will turn out in my favor. All right, so was it the Tea Party? Sarah Palin effect that tipped the scale. Joining me now to reflect on his big win is for the uh, Republican nominee for U.S. Senate is Joe Miller. We can call it the Tea Party, uh, Governor Palin, Mark Levin effect, because I know he was a big supporter of yours. Uh, welcome to the program, Joe. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Sean, for having me. All right, we do have about a three-second delay. Now, let, let me ask you this, because you started out this campaign, 54% of people didn't know you. Early on this summer, you were down by 40 points in this campaign, I saw according to one poll. Uh, you were able to come back. What do you think the difference was? What happened in this campaign? Well, we started April 19th, and really what put uh, this campaign on the map was, of course, Governor Palin's endorsement initially, and then we had the Tea Party join in, as your introductory comments reflected. But what really motivated this campaign was the volunteer network. Uh, we had just an incredible group of people in this state coming together, working day and night to make this happen. We're a very large state geographically, as your viewers know, of course, but small in population. And so the numbers of volunteers dedicated to the effort, and of course the resonance of the message is really what carried this thing forward. We also, of course, had Governor Huckabee join the fray. We had a number of state legislators, uh, Lieutenant Governor Lauren Lehman, also assist with endorsements. But again, it was kind of a perfect storm of the volunteer network, yeah. the endorsements, and just the hard effort uh, that really brought this thing forward. All right, your opponent in this race, a guy by the name of Scott McAdams, is quoted as saying about the, the DCCC that the National Democratic Party doesn't even know my name. In fact, there was an AP story that in, uh, confirmed that Senate Democrats move very quickly to see whether or not uh, you could give them an opening in, in the state of Alaska because you were unknown and because, quote, you're part of the evil Tea Party movement. Uh, so, in fact, I don't think he was actually being honest with the people of Alaska in this radio interview he gave. Well, frankly, uh, we aren't very concerned about what we're facing uh, up in the general election. Obviously, we're going to work this just as hard as we worked the primary. Uh, but the message that we're carrying forward to Alaskans resonates, and that is, look, the federal government is broken. The only answer out of this mess is to return power to the states. And for Alaska, where almost two-thirds of the land is under federal title, it's a message that Alaskans can grab hold of. They understand that that is a way out to the economic problems that we have. It's a way to actually create an economic engine to the country. I was watching an interview that you, you gave, I guess it was this weekend, and it seems that the national media has turned on you in, in pretty quick fashion here. And they're trying to portray you as extreme because you recognize that entitlement spending in Washington is unsustainable. Social Security, Medicare, the new health care bill that they passed, you know, all of this money adds up and that we can't afford it. So you've, you've talked about other solutions, partial privatization, privatization of Social Security and some other things. What do you say when the national media is trying to say that anybody that wants to cut back on entitlements must be extreme when all you're saying is balance the budget and live within our constitutional mandate? Right. Well, you know, my answer to that is if you believe that's extreme, then obviously you believe our founders were extreme. And frankly, that's not a message that Americans are going to accept. They see out of their common sense that the federal entitlement state is broken, hopelessly broken, and they understand that there has to be a solution beyond the socialist expansion that I think Obama is moving forward. And that solution is to return power back to the states, to allow the states to act as economic engines, to get the federal government out of the way so that we can progress this country, again, out of the states, and generate the economic benefits that we need to get the, the country moving again. Like a lot of Democrats, we see your opponent now is racing away from 
the national leadership. He's now saying that he, he doesn't need national support. Uh, what do you think? What do you think that's saying? Well, I think he's running away from Obama. Uh, you know, he's been characterized already as left of Senator Begich. Uh, we know that he understands that that message is a failure. It's going to be very difficult for him to run under the Democratic Party banner and not endorse all of the expansionistic policies of the federal government. And we know that's broken. It doesn't work. It leads to less competitiveness. It leads to dependency. And it leads to the bankruptcy that's coming upon us. So he's running away from it. But, you know, a Democrat, at least uh, the type that he represents, is uh, exactly, exactly the type of opponent that I think is going to fail with the message that we brought, and that is returning power to the states. You know, it's and fascinating. Getting back to the constitutional but, mandates. But between you and Rand Paul and Sharon Angle, you know, three examples with the establishment lost. What does that say about the establishment Republican Party? Well, I believe that the Republican Party needs to embrace this new movement because it is the answer to the problems facing the country. And I think if the Republican Party does that, uh, that it's very likely that it can again lead the country and it can lead to a renaissance here. Uh, and that's what we're encouraging. I, I want to also mention, Sean, that, uh, you know, Senator Murkowski, uh, it was a class act last night. It was exceptionally honorable uh, for her to do what she did. It avoids a, a recount. Um, and, and in addition to that, I think that your listeners need to understand that uh, she fought hard for Alaska. Just an extraordinary warrior for the interest of this state. You know, we had a different vision. But, but frankly, I, I think all right. we, we all need to, to sit back and recognize that, that she made real contributions to the state of Alaska. All right, Joe Miller, good luck. We're going to follow this campaign closely. Appreciate you being with us. And don't forget, by the way, you can head on over to foxnation.com for the very latest details on the midterm elections and all the other hot topics we are covering and new explosive details about the controversial imam behind the Moscow Ground Zero. That much more. Michelle Malkin is next straight ahead.